Uh, for a little background, in cardiac fibrosis, the myocytes are replaced by tissue that is unable to contract. The fibroblasts, which produce collagen to enable wound healing, provide excessive amounts of the protein, and this results in abnormal scarring. The process hardens the heart, making it inflexible, and the progression of the disease will lead to heart failure. Uh, again, imaging biomarkers of fibrosis will assist us in early detection of cardiomyopathy. Uh, and the aim of this study was to assess the fibrosis using both conventional echocardiography, uh, speckle tracking or strain imaging, and also looking at that ultrasound backscatter intensity and the RF spectral content in, these, in the mouse model. So uh, just a little background on the model we used. Under IACUC approval, we induced cardiac fibrosis uh, using a pharmacological agent to chronically increase heart rate. That agent is called isoproterenol. Uh, and we explored that agent at two different doses, a low dose and a high dose. Uh, the mice were imaged for standard, standard echo, strain, and NRF mode to assess fibrosis uh, at baseline, day 12 and day 20. Uh, and the excised heart sections at the end of the study were stained for picroserious red and the percent area of that staining was computed to reflect the fibrotic content. Uh, so these are just uh, examples of our conventional echocardiogram analysis. So we always collect a short axis M mode image and we use that analysis for parameters such as fractional shortening. And then we do uh, the trace on the long axis image as well and we use that for systolic and uh, diastolic volume, stroke volume, and ejection fraction. So when we look at some of the results in our study, uh, when we looked at fractional shortening, we could see a really nice response in the high dose of isoproterenol. We do see a dose dependent effect at both day 12 and day 21. Uh, the, a high dose of isoproterenol compared to vehicle was statistically significant, but we see a very significant drop of fractional shortening in the study. And similarly, in ejection fraction in the long axis, we see again a dose-dependent separation between the low and the high dose versus vehicle that carries out throughout the study. Uh, when we look at measures of hypertrophy, uh, so the heart is working harder, and so uh, we would expect that some hypertrophy would occur during this study, and in fact, we can see that very clearly. Uh, I've only put up two uh, measurements here, but this did uh, uh, follow out in multiple parameters. We see a big increase in LV mass, and we do see that dose-dependent effect. Uh, similarly, if we look at the left ventricle area in diastole, we see a significant effect both at day, oops, that should be day 12, and uh, day 21 of study in the high dose of isoproterenol. So enhancing the cardiac exam uh, is very important uh, for us. Cardiac strain represents the deformation of the heart either regionally or globally relative to its original shape. Strain has greater sensitivity to detect global changes in cardiac function at earlier time points than conventional echo can provide. Strain analysis is based on speckle tracking over the cardiac cycle. Longitudinal and circumferential strain represent the shortening of the myocardium and thus demonstrate negative curves. Radial strain represents the lengthening of the tissue and is thus a positive curve. You can look at velocity, displacement, strain, and strain rate. And here this graphic uh, is just giving you some idea of the directional strain that we're looking at here. So strain analysis uh, is really the next revolution in echocardiography. Uh, Two-dimensional speckle tracking uh, is a promising new imaging modality. It permits offline calculation of myocardial velocities and deformation parameters such as strain and strain rate. It's well accepted that these parameters provide important insights into systolic and diastolic function, ischemia, myocardial mechanics, and many other pathophysiological processes of the heart. Uh, speckle tracking echo works by computing deformation from the standard 2D grayscale images, and it's able to overcome many of the limitations of tissue Doppler imaging, which is what is commonly used in the human clinic. 
So these are just some examples from the fibrosis study that we conducted. This is a normal mouse treated with vehicle, and this is uh, the strain window for that mouse. And you can see here, looking at the radial strain and the longitudinal strain, we see that this heart is working well in synchrony, uh, and all of the curves are relatively well lined up. When I look at the segmental synchronicity, uh, a similar this is this is similar to a heat map. I want to see uh, that the tissue is all working nicely, and I want to see sort of happy blues in these images and greens in in the ones below it. So if we move on to a low dose isoproteranol animal, we start to see some changes. Uh, we start to see some changes in the synchronicity of the walls, and in fact, here we see one wall that's moving much differently than the others. And that plays out into these heat maps as well, where we see that blue wall that's moving differently here uh, has a much different value, and its color map has changed. And when we look at our high dose of isoproteranol, we really start to see these effects illuminated to us. Uh, we can see none of the none of the uh, walls are aligning well here. Uh, there's a very different uh, strain in, in all of these heart sections. And again, when we look at these heat maps, now we're really starting to see uh, big changes in how the heart is moving and in specific segments of the heart that aren't functioning as well as others. And so I put those uh, three, this is just a single beat from vehicle, low-dose, and high-dose isoproteranol here uh, so that you guys could really see those differences. Uh, and you can really see the, the difference here between a vehicle, a low-dose, and a high-dose where that heart damage is becoming quite distinct. And again, when we look at that segmental analysis, we can see that big change in color starting to occur uh, here in our low-dose model but even more pronounced in our high-dose model. Uh, it was interesting to note that you see a lot of the changes here in the uh, center segments of the septum, uh, and uh, it was interesting to find out at the end of the study that there was a circumferential pattern to the fibrosis development. So I think that our strain was picking up that uh, development of the fibrotic tissue very nicely. And so if we look at the strain, these two top graphs are looking at the strain at the final day of the study, which was on day 21. We can see a noted difference between low and high dose, although we don't see a dose-dependent effect here when we look at radial strain. However, when we look at longitudinal strain, uh, we do see that nice dose-dependent effect of our low and high dose of isoproteranol. Uh, and more importantly, when we looked at the strain imaging over time, we see that nice separation again in our model and a very dose-dependent effect at day 12. Uh, and the advantage of strain imaging is that it's going to allow you to see these changes much earlier uh, than when you might see a change in fractional shortening. Uh, so it's very critical uh, to apply this type of imaging um, and, and be able to see its sensitivity. So moving on, uh, I'm, Teresa's just going to talk a little about the RF acquisition for these slides. Teresa, do you want to go ahead? I hope. The megahertz. Maybe I'll keep. Oh, there she is. Oh, can you? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? So. Uh, with the heart, we do similar analysis that we did with the liver, a slight differentiation, uh, because we don't have the depth that we get with the liver. And, and essentially what we want to do is, is get the echo data from the, the high-frequency probe, looking at both systole, systole and diastole. We have uh, smaller regions of interest, but we can get the, the septum and the posterior wall. Uh, the analysis, again, we're using the, the raw data, and this uh, allows us to uh, have analysis before you have the post-processing from the, the gain and, and the power settings. Again, we're taking the RF segments and using a spectrum analysis based on, on the 4A transform to look at the uh, Gaussian uh, shape spectrum. In this particular case, the computed parameters were not only the mean intensity, but we were also looking at the integrated backscatter, so if we integrate that, the, the spectrum, this gives us some additional information in terms of um, 
changes in, in both the high and low frequencies, which you can see uh, differences from the, the different heart states. So turning this back to Terry, this is the quick. Thank you. No problem. So these are just examples of the regions of interest that we collected uh, with the RF data. Again, you know, you can see that RF spectra here. Uh, I would caution people that are going to undertake RF imaging, it collects huge amounts of data uh, and you need to be ready to collect uh, 100 gigabytes of data in a single time point uh, with the RF uh, analysis. Um, but we put small regions of interest uh, in systole and diastole in both the septum and the posterior wall uh, and similarly here in the short axis uh, in the anterior and posterior sections of the heart. And so when we looked at both the mean intensity and the integrated spectrum or energy that was generated from our RF analysis, again, we see that nice dose-dependent effect between our low and our high dose of isoproteranol. Both of these were statistically significant from vehicle. Uh, and when we look at the integrated spectrum or energy in diastole, we see a similar response. Uh, again, a nice dose-dependent effect, uh, statistically significant in the high dose. And when we compare this to histology, uh, we see a very similar result uh, in our picroserious red staining. So picroserious red special stain results correlated really nicely with both uh, the uh, ultrasound measures and the subjective histo histopathologist grading of the fibrosis. Um, however, we thought that uh, histology was a little more sensitive at elucidating minimal fibrosis when present. Uh, by H&E evaluation. Uh, so when the pathologist independently grades these slides, uh, they'll score them from zero to four, very similar to the human data that Teresa showed earlier. Uh, and here we are looking at uh, a computer calculation of the percent marker area. But these both correlated highly with our ultrasound results. So uh, just a little about the histology uh, from this cardiac fibrosis model. All of the vehicle-treated mice had no significant heart findings or increased picroserious red staining. The isoproteranol-treated mice had heart lesions in which the severity was dose-dependent. It was characterized by variable amounts of degeneration and necrosis of the cardiomyocytes. And the associated fibrosis and cellular infiltrates most often affected the myocardium in a circumferential pattern adjacent to the ventricular lumen. So our uh, results and conclusions from our cardiac fibrosis study, the integrated backscatter and mean intensity increased in all groups in both studies. Uh, this is indicative of increased attenuation associated with an increased collagen content. Our conventional echocardiography showed functional changes in the isoproteranol model, uh, particularly in measures of hypertrophy such as LV mass. The quantitative assessment of RF ultrasound signals appears to be promising uh, as a measure of myocardial fibrosis uh, and for use in monitoring cardiac disease progression and potentially a response to a new therapy in development. Uh, however, strain analysis appeared to be the most sensitive method of detecting the fibrotic changes in the heart at these early time points, and it is a little easier uh, to analyze for strain than it is to write code for the RF analysis. So that could be a significant time savings for us. So in conclusion, the RF ultrasound analysis that we've performed in the liver and the heart shows a lot of promise for monitoring liver fibrosis longitudinally and non-invasively in both models of carbon tetrachloride-induced cirrhosis and in a, in a NASH model in the mouse. Uh, our model of cardiac fibrosis uh, RF ultrasound showed value, however, strain and speckle tracking echo appeared to be a more sensitive method for detecting fibrotic tissue development. Uh, and in conclusion, we always uh, say uh, we really feel that ultrasound plays a vital role in our drug development process. Longitudinal data acquisition reduces the number of animals required per study. It's a refined technology that we can directly translate to the human clinic. Uh, and ultrasound-derived functional and morphological and anatomical data can replace more invasive measures. I'd like to thank you for calling in today. I hope you've all found this talk very helpful. Uh, my references are at the end of the study for every, anyone who is interested.